Hi everyone! Welcome to Schoology Leap. I'm Mike Indeglio. And I'm Sara Vina. I hope that everyone is well this afternoon. I know that I'm feeling a little refreshed. I had about seven cups of coffee in the... It's way too many. In, it's too many cups of in coffee. In the break between leaps. <laughs> but we are here, we are fired up, and I am sweating coffee mm -hmm. as we speak. Um, Potent. The last we sat down here together was in 2017, way back then. Except for this morning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you're really breaking that fourth wall here for us. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the new year to all of you out there. I hope that the first few weeks of 2018 finds you happy, well-rested, and ready to push forward into 2018. We here at Schoology just had our company on site, our kickoff for 2018, mm -hmm. which is the, an opportunity for all of our remote employees to come on in and for us to do some activities, have some have some fun times. We had a talent show. We did. Um, and also kind of refocus, look at where we've been in 2017 and, and, and where we're going. And so I know we talked a lot on our team about rededicating to our mission, which is to advance what's possible in education, which sounds really kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Lofty. Lofty. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's exactly what we're trying to do. And it's what we hope all of you are trying to do out there in the educational world. And so we're going to touch on some topics today, but then I thought we would invite a guest who could speak to, you know, from boots on the ground, on the front lines of education, speak to where they're headed, how they're pushing the envelope in 2018. And I thought that maybe that would bring some inspiration to our community uh, and to our listeners. And so we're really excited about the interview we had with Dr. Indeglio that's coming up in a few minutes. But before then, we wanted to share some things about uh, what's happening internally here at Schoology and give you a little bit of information about how you can check up on some of the upcoming releases. Yeah, we've shifted a little bit um, around the way that we are going to be releasing information in terms of our product releases. So we do something called a web release every night where we get all of the ins and outs and the nitty gritty details about how we've changed the platform, things like little fixes for defects, but then also big picture things. When we come up with a really cool, big new idea, how do we message that to everyone and make sure everyone stays in the know? Um, and so we've got a new system as opposed to trying to get out little bits of information throughout the um, the whole range of all of the people <laughs> that use Schoology. We figured it would be easier rather than dabbling it out to actually do web releases. So we're gonna be releasing once a month our published release notes um, I'll pop up a link with a little more information about how that works. Um, but we'll have a ton of different features that'll be coming out, some bigger than others, and we want you all to make sure that you know what's going on. So it'll be basically a summarized release notes. Um, you'll get it in email form and you can sign up for it too. And that email will highlight all kinds of different things that we need you to be aware of, um, and then hopefully new and exciting information. So once a month, once a month seemed a little bit more uh, digestible rather than trying to keep track all the time. And this will be layman's terms, so not you know high and flighty tech stuff. Um, so look out for that. That'll be starting uh, this month, going all the way through next year to test that out to begin with. That's what's happening on our side. We're hoping that you guys have had thus far a fruitful and and positive start to your 2018. I'm sure that the hits are going to keep on coming. All right. So now, next thing is next. Dr. Indeglio, can you can you hear us OK? I can hear you guys just fine. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Welcome to Schoology Leap. Uh, for those of you who, who maybe think it's a little bit more familiar than you recall, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but you joined Brad on Schoology Leap back in, I believe it was early 2015. Yeah, it was definitely a couple years ago, and uh, I do believe it was one of the uh, one of the first leaps that took place. So uh, I was happy to be a part of the uh, the early goings of this amazing presentation. You you guys are great. You need your own talk show. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, we'll let our bosses know. Um, at that time, correct me if I'm wrong. Once again, you were in I, I believe year two of a of a four year Schoology rollout. Is that how you were? Is Correct. The uh, the official rollout was a three year rollout, but we added an additional year to it, um, figuring it would probably take us that long to really integrate um, from the previous platform to using this one to maximize uh, teacher and student engagement. Great. So now you're here uh, after c fully completing your rollout. Have were there anything you learned uh, during the process? A question I ran a webinar a few weeks back about 
um, the rollout process. And one of the questions we got was, you know, if you could go back in time at the start of your initiative and ask one question or change one thing, uh, what piece of advice or what one question would you ask your your back in time self? Um, well, I think actually I would reinforce the notion of uh, taking your time with the rollout. So uh, three years actually would have been enough time, but the extra fourth year, which was spent having teachers uh, solely in the platform, uh, not going live with courses initially, but spending that first year learning uh, how to, to use the system, how to make sure that we had some things that had commonalities and consistencies across courses, um, really becoming comfortable with the platform before we tried to take it to the next level because you can't really create until you understand something. And uh, that extra year really gave our staff the time to get on board um, and then move forward with a lot of the really cool things that Schoology can do. Um, so I would say uh, if you wanted one specific piece of advice, it would be the parent training piece in that mm -hmm. the students learned it right away. The teachers had all this time to learn it, but we really don't have the ability to have dedicated training time for parents. Um, so if you can find a way to build that in, whether if it's storing um, you know, a bulleted point in a newsletter, if you do video newsletters or, or video shows for your families, to roll that in, uh, send some stuff home if you're not into the digital part. But um, the more parent training you can get, the better, because the whole idea of a learning management platform is to remove the obstacle of communication. And this definitely takes it to the next level. Wow, we could actually spend 45 minutes just talking about that. That's a really great piece of advice that is that often gets sort of looked at secondarily. If, if parents is something you're going to, if, if including parents on the platform is something you're looking to do, that's a great thing to really tackle up front. I think that's uh, that's something that people kind of push off as a secondary item, and and, and that's not always the best scenario if, if, if parents is something you really want to work in as an integral part of the system. Well, if you're going to use Schoology at the elementary or the middle level, then it's a necessity. Um, it, if your district is looking to um, employ Schoology uh, for the learning management system purposes and you are you have decided at this point not to include the parents, um, I would highly advise you to reevaluate that because the idea is to have um, a, a one-stop shop, whether it's grades, whether it's posting of events and assignments and, and really running the course through the the, uh, the system, um, you have to have the parents understand it, be able to access it. Um, otherwise, you're going to be doing 10 times more work uh, with, the, with the community piece. And, you know, uh, once again, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but the communication piece is, is so key. Would you say that you're finding that aside from, you know, classroom management, do you find that that communication with parents, even in the summer, is something that you guys have leaned heavily on the system for? Yes, uh, we have found that uh, for our our generational gap um, for parents that Facebook and within Schoology have been the two best ways to easily access all of the parents. So uh, whereas the students, Schoology by far, because that's our learning management system, they are always on Schoology. But from there, we'll use Instagram and that's kind of like the way to reach them. With the parents, it's uh, Facebook, email blasts, and then Schoology as well. But that's only because we have parents on board with Schoology and that was an integral part of our rollout process. It's a, again, it's a one-stop shop and you wanna be able to go right to it without having to duplicate efforts. So we've been talking a bit here, oh, let's see, I, there you are, um, about zooming out. And I really wanna get, I really wanna get your insight on that as we move forward. But before we do, I wanted to point out and congratulate you um, for our users um, you're a recipient of the 2017 Digital Principal of the Year Award. Um, and I thought we'd take a minute just to let you just talk about what that is and what efforts you've been making that that helped you be recognized in that in that area. Yeah, it's it's funny. Uh, and after winning the award, people would joke that uh, maybe some maybe someday you'll win the uh, the real principal award, <laughs> not the virtual <laughs> one. Um, but the idea is uh, it's pushing the envelope in terms of improving the educational environment and enabling teachers, students, and the entire school community to really embrace how learning can be enhanced 
by technology. So it's not all going online and being digital and one-to-one -one devices. It's trying to improve instruction, trying to um, enhance learning. So we look at everything from in education. Our goal is achievement, right? Student achievement. And that happens academically, that happens behaviorally, that happens socially, that happens emotionally. Technology is a tool that it's, it's, it's its own toolbox at this point. There are so many ways that we can expand what we do and enhance what we do. However, a lot of the times we're just using technology as um, a new overhead projector, <laughs> you know, we, from right. the days of when we were in school and you had the vis a vis markers on the overhead. Well, you know, a lot of times all we're doing is throwing that onto a PowerPoint, doing note taking. That's not what technology is supposed to do. Um, so really, the 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 award um, I think is given to people really trying to push the envelope there, willing to try new things and take risks. Um, not so much being an expert on uh, digital content necessarily. Yeah, and that's a great point. You know, a lot of times I think districts come in with a plan and the the ultimate goal is to either um, fulfill the one-to-one -one initiative or to roll out an LMS. And that's sort of where the goals end. And that's sort of a false summit because once you get there, the technology itself is not going to create the paradigm shift you're looking for. It's not going to make any changes. You know, it, it's more of a replacement. Like you said, you know, the difference between a smart board and a, and a, and a chalkboard are, are not many unless, you, unless you're using it to, to really push the envelope. Exactly. And in order for our teachers to be able to push that envelope, they need to have the proper training. They need to have the proper resources. They need to have the time to practice. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we throw in education, we throw these initiatives out. We throw hardware at people. You know what I mean? Hey, here's a smart board. Here's an iPad. Um, without training them. And we're professionals. You know, we, we have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, and we spent this intense amount of time on our schooling. And you can't just expect, boom, here's this and now use it. You know what I mean? We have to really start treating ourselves as a profession like any other profession where we're going to be able to spend the time necessary, you know, really uh, e exhaust all our resources to become the experts in some areas. That doesn't mean we don't try new things, but it means we're prepared to try them in the best interest of kids. And, and that's sort of where, where I really want to spend some time talking with you today. I, a good image I, I often come up with is that you know, education itself, the education institution, uh, you, you mentioned this quite often when we talk, is very slow moving. You can think of it as like a luxury cruise liner or the Titanic. You know, just even if you turn the wheel hard right, it's still going to take some time to get that enormous entity moving in that direction. Correct. And, and yet we sit at the precipice of this new dawn of technology, which is advancing at rapid paces. The second you catch up with what's happening now, it's already obsolete. All right. So it's an interesting time to be sitting at the nexus of this incredibly fast moving technology and this institution that is generally known for not, you know, even after they make decisions, moving on a, on a rather slow basis. So I mean, it's exciting to see people in the space trying to find ways to use this rapidly moving technology to help um, advance education at a more quicker pace. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. So one of the goals you had mentioned um, was, uh, I believe you called it uh, redefining student success in the 21st century. And I think real quick, let's just establish what you believe as a principal, as a doctor, as as someone who's been working as in education for, geez, how long has it been now? Uh, gosh, 18, 19 years. What do you think at the end of the day is the ultimate single goal for educators? What are we what are we preparing uh, students for? Well, um, actually, if you uh, can you forward to that the slide or I can because I love to build off of that. The there we go. Um, we tried to put we tried to put what you just asked into a very cohesive, um, simple graphic. And this is uh, for both our teachers, our students, our parents. Uh, this is for everyone. This is for all the stakeholders. And I think this very quickly summarizes what our goals for the students are. And again, I could go on for hours, but I'm going to try to summarize this for you very quickly. In the end, the goal of our, our, our public and or parochial and whatever system you're working in um, is student achievement. All right. So student learning, student achievement. And again, that's not just academic. We have to look at it from the whole child lens. So achievement is academic, behavioral, emotional, and social. All right. How do we achieve that? 
Well, we have to have uh, a rigorous curriculum and lessons, and we have to be able to engage our students. Without those two things, you can't reach where we have to go. Now, particularly at the middle level, but this is applicable at all levels, and maybe it's even more important at the high school level um, as we move forward, are engaging our students based on the skills they will need for success in the 21st century. We've done a lot of work in our middle level um, in Downingtown over the past uh, six, seven months towards the notion that it's no longer about uh, getting the good grades, getting a high ranking, going to the right college. You're not necessarily going to be successful coming out of college just having a resume in, per se. It's about the four C's, the skills that will lead to success in our current and evolving global economy. Those C's are collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. A ton of research exists on these. A ton of organizations has done this research. This is where things are heading. It's heavily emphasized in uh, Ted Dintersmith and Tony Wagner's work uh, called Most Likely to Succeed. It's an amazing book and an amazing film, uh, which we screened for our whole middle level staff. We rented out a movie theater at the beginning of the school year, brought our staff, uh, had popcorn and soda and watched the movie, um, and really tried to key in on why these skills uh, are the direction we have to go. So achievement looks like the um, attainment of these skills. And inside of all of that, in gaining those skills, we have to teach our students to develop empathy, and to accept personal responsibility for their actions. So I just took you top down, but you can also look at that going from down to the top. You know, if you start with empathy and the uh, personal own your actions, ownership, then you build to those four C's. From there, you get the achievement in those four realms um, where our students and uh, hopefully everyone is gonna be able to succeed moving forward. So I think that's a great, a great zoomed out top down perspective of what you and your in your district have decided or at least in your building have decided that's the initiative you're going to push so a lot of people would say okay that's great and that's a great visual but how do you get that into application how do you start you know you've got your lms rolled out you've got this new initiative and you're, you want to focus on the four c's now you know from your your perspective how do we push that forward and this was the this was the first year you were going to start you know, making this a reality. And so walk us through how some of the things you've been doing to, to do so. Well, when we say similarly to how the, the Schoology rollout was a four year rollout, okay, this isn't something that we just decided and said, bam, we're gonna make it happen. We have been setting the stage for this over the past eight years. Eight years, um, it takes a lot of time. Uh, our sister middle school, which is right across the district from us, and, and the principal, John Ross, um, the other half of the Rockstar Principals, uh, we collaborate very closely um, in developing what these plans will look like. And we've spent the past eight years building capital in the community with parents. We've worked really hard within the district with our superintendent, with each of our departments to really outline what we want this to look like. Because a lot of the things that we are now doing go against the grain. They go against the direction that the slow moving luxury liner of K-12 education moves towards. And I believe the three things we decided to talk about today are going to focus on those. None of these things can happen unless you have spent a lot of time with your debits and credits. That's what I, I use that analogy sometimes. I've spent eight years in district with my staff, with our families, with our community, with everyone building my credits, right? So my bank account right now, I've got some, I've got the ability to cash out and you've got to do that at this point because we're taking a leap here. We're starting to tell people, hey, we're not focusing, uh, we're not going to focus anymore on the letter grade. We're not going to focus anymore on uh, the old way of doing things. Just because we've always done it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. So I don't want to just go off willy nilly. You like that term, Mike? Um, if you want to key in specifically on one of the three things we had decided on, uh, you tell me what direction you want to go. Sure. Um, let's start. Um, one of the things that you had you had spoken with me about um, a variety of times was something that really spoke to me because you and I often talk about how, you know, a person is made up a lot more than just what they do for a living. You know, a lot of different passions and a lot of different things that sort of motivate them intrinsically to, uh, to do research, to, to be engaged. And so I, I think you found a really neat way to, um, to combine personal passions for your, your staff, as well as reaching out as student outreach 
and also cultivating a third space, uh, utilizing the LMS, which you, uh, I think you've called Friday Clubs or Passion Projects. So could you spend a little bit of time talking about those? Sure. Um, and I would say this is uh, this is a nice lead in because this was an easy thing to implement. And what it tri what we tried to accomplish was we were trying to show our students in our community and our staff um, that there's more to learning than just what's singularly in the curriculum. All right. It's not just about uh, what happens within the four walls of a classroom for something identified as like science. So in, at the middle level, most places have an advisory period or a homeroom period at the end of the day. Ours is called Reach, and it's about a 20 minute to 25 minute time frame. Uh, gives kids a chance to uh, get caught up on work. We run our digital citizenship lessons during this time. We have a school-wide positive behavioral support system that's uh, in place. And on Fridays, we've launched the passion projects. Our, we call them Friday clubs for simplicity's sake. And here's how it works. Every adult staff member in the building had to come up with something they're passionate about doesn't have to do anything with school, okay? So uh, we have professional fishermen in our school that run a fish uh, fishing club. We have uh, cat lovers who run the Crazy Cat Lady Club. Um, I'm a big uh, proponent my whole life of uh, weightlifting and powerlifting, so my club is gonna be the powerlifting club. Our other assistant principal is running the badminton club. We're doing a slam poetry club from some of our ELA teachers. The range of... Um, different options are amazing. So we have like 70 different staff members running clubs. They wrote up a short description. We turned that into basically like a, a course handbook. Uh, and then students using a platform, I think we used Wufu or, or something, I don't, I don't remember exactly. But then they signed up for one full marking period of Friday clubs. So for about a half an hour a week, they're getting with a teacher who believes in something strongly, cares about something strongly, something they're interested in, and they get to learn about that. They get to do activities and participate and kind of like engage the four C's from that perspective. Um, I'm very type A, I'm OCD. So uh, for my club, um, I decided to maximize the use of Schoology. So once the list came out of what students were in my club, I created the course, I added them to the course, and then I uh, created my resources and lessons based on that. So, and, I, and you have, I see the screenshot that's up that just shows that to a small degree. Um, and here, here's what's interesting. This all sounds great, right? But we know that you have early adopters and people who really buy in, and you have people who don't as much. So for that first marking period of clubs, you know, we had some teachers who weren't re really on board right away, and they wanted to do a movie club where you just sit in the room and watch movies. Well, we allowed that. But here's the thing. The kids didn't sign up for that club. Huh. All, of, all of the sudden, you started seeing the kids sign up for the things that people really did have a passion for. Crazy Cat Lady Club, run by Madame Swalina. There was a waiting list to get into that because she was passionate. The description, they make organic cat treats and toys with cat. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, and then, I mean, to be completely, you know, on the other end of that, there are some teachers who said, you know, right now I'm not really feeling anything passionate, but I'm really, I'm into kids and I want to do something. You know, what if we just do a walking club where we walk outside the building for the 20 minutes and we'll talk, you know, like a walk and talk. And that's very popular as well because there's a need for that. Um, so it, it's, you can definitely tell the ones who bought in, the ones who didn't. Um, and you can see how for the second marking period, which is now coming to an end, uh, it expanded. Some of, the, some of the teacher submissions for the second marking period were a lot deeper um, in terms of their context and, um, and whatnot. One other uh, funny club that we had, uh, one of our teachers loves different recipes for hot chocolate. <laughs> so they, they did a hot chocolate club and explored recipes from around the world have 20 or 30 kids in interested in that. Uh, another one that you know I, I never would have thought of but is hugely popular, uh, Cosmetics Club. They do nails, you know, different colors, different designs, the painting, the artistic stuff. Um, it's just there's something for everyone. Um, a couple of points I'll make and then we'll push forward. Uh, one thing I love about this weightlifting club, which is why I put this screenshot up, is that um, you know, one thing we had discussed is, is, is you allow the students also to take it the next step. So yes, you, you have that in-person meeting time, but like you, you've utilized a course here in Schoology, and thus you can see you've started. To, I can see you start to fill out some course completion rules, so that yep. in essence you're making this self-paced, so that students can go in and at their own pace, you know, complete their workouts or complete some of the um, tutorials that you've laid out here. So that's a uh, that's a great job. I give you a pat on the back for that. Yeah. Well, for me, the best part is, um, you know, 
I do the instruction during the actual club time, but a half an hour is not a lot of time. So I teach the fundamentals of, let's say, deadlift. I have the kids in my club go through and I, I, I tweak and I give advice and whatnot, but then they go home. I have plenty of internet resources. They can watch good form videos. They read the article. Then they video themselves and submit it to me, and then I can watch and critique outside of club time. So it's more than just that 30 minutes a week. You know, and in, in a time when there are 16, 17, 18 year old kids who cultivate a YouTube following or cultivate, you know, just use their passion to launch into, you know, really successful entrepreneurial ventures. This is, this is a great way to sort of encourage passions, encourage people to seek out the things that interest them because we're living in a time when I believe, you know, that, that has a bit more of a, there's more opportunity moving forward into the, the 21st century workforce than there, than there was, you know, only a few years ago. Well, just, and I don't want to dovetail too far off what I know our topic is today, but I think this is very applicable when we're talking about the global economy. I want you to think about this for, and the whole audience, everyone, everyone who's listening and being a part of this right now, think about this. Five years ago, when the Emmy Awards uh, did their nominations, there were, I think, 150 eligible, quote, television shows eligible for awards. Five years later, there's over 500 of them. Currently in existence, there are over 300,000 individual podcasts, if you go through uh, Stitcher, iTunes, et cetera, that you can basically come in and find anything that you're looking for. In terms of YouTube alone, just when you look at YouTubers these days, like content creation, there is a subgenre now of, of um, I guess it's, it's both consumption and content creation that being, you know, I'm in my early 40s, I can't even fathom or access a lot of what these kids are doing these days. You look at YouTubers like Cookie Swirl C and they do the unboxing of these surprise bags. You look at Dude Perfect who have maximized, you know, like the the sports and the, the cool trick element of different things. You look at the Minecrafters, the one who play the video games and, 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 and you know, have that online. It's a world way beyond what we have ever had before or understand before. And these people are monetizing and making a living off of this. Now think about it. This has nothing to do with most of the skills they gathered th traditionally through their schooling. But if you look at each of those four C's, that's where you're going to maximize the ability to be successful in this type of work environment these days. Sorry, I, I, I dovetailed. No. That's great. I was. We just uh, one of our one of our um, guests shared. Uh, John, thank you for the for the chat. John was letting us know that he just heard yesterday that there are three hundred hours of YouTube content uploaded every minute, every minute. Wow. Uh, there it is. That's a that that basically sums all of that up. Now, not, we're not saying that's all good content. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Obviously. And and one of the things I think that's also important to mention here is that. As kids go through school, right, the way we went through school, we were content consumers. We were given information, right? Today, content itself is ubiquitous. You can find the answer to any depth of knowledge level one or level two question by Googling it. <laughs> it's that simple. What we have to switch towards is the content creation right? That's where critical thinking gets applied. That's where at your higher levels of bloom, your higher levels of DOK, and the ability to think critically lets you analyze all of this stuff and say, what's real, what's not real? You know, the concept of fake news, et cetera. Um, that, that's really where the, our, we're going to get our most bang for our buck. And we're doing our kids a disservice if we are not advocating for that. So on, uh, as far as that, that gels with time management, our kids are these clubs being held after school? Did you say there was a specific period you were utilizing for this? Yeah, that's it. we do it during our advisory period on Fridays. Uh, we purposely didn't want it to be after school because we wanted everyone to be involved. We still have a ton of after school, you know, clubs and activities. We still run sports. This is just one little extra thing. And what? And, and to kind of segue into our, my next point here, what did that advisory period generally be used for in the past? Uh, uh, a couple of days a week would be for uh, makeup work, going to visit teachers to uh, clarify information from a class. Again, we do digital citizenship lessons. Uh, yeah, so basically like a homeroom period, you know, get some work done. So I, I imagine there's no actual scores or, or 
grades right. being given to these groups. Right. So yep. I wanted to segue, let that segue into our next point because I know you're very passionate about this as well. Um, talk to me a little bit about moving away from test prep. Uh, some, well, first, set up the challenge you had with, with testing and kind of the incongruent, incongruency you saw between test prep and the actual um, outcomes versus what you believed how that what that time was taking away from as far as your students progression and what you've started to do to, to replace that time sure and this has again been a uh, you know i've been in my school for eight years now so we've been building toward this uh, at the entire middle level in downingtown for the past eight years um and uh, for all of our listeners i know we're preaching to the choir just on the topic but great new book that just came out by Dan Koretz, K-O-R-E-T-Z. He's from uh, uh, Harvard. Uh, it's called The Testing Charade. He gives a really, really good outline of uh, the entire uh, historical context of how we've, we've become a basically a standardized testing machine uh, across uh, the country. Um, and then he gives some ideas for moving forward. Great book. But very quickly, since uh, you know, uh, No Child Left Behind, ESCA was reauthorized back in uh, 2001, um, it's become about uh, using standardized tests as the the end result there you know so much was tied to it from a uh, high stakes uh, you know f uh, uh, component in, in terms of being singled out uh, and and ranked and all this other stuff that that's where our that's where we started putting our emphasis we know we have to move past that all right and and the the illustration of the four c's alone the skills that actual research in industry is showing in corporations and the development of uh, where we're headed as a as an economy um, in a capitalistic society uh, are, are on the softer skills these four c's we know inherently that by focusing on more important things uh, higher level thinking that you know test scores will be okay however these standardized tests across the country they're so specific that if you're not doing test prep you know, you might be missing out on maximizing your scores or whatnot. We have finally reached a point when we've been building towards it for years where we're actually saying, that's not what we're about anymore. That's not what we're gonna focus on. We're coming out and we're saying it. Uh, we hear you, we hear the, the stress, the anxiety. We've caused so much uh, strife for our students these days. So the focus has gone towards authentic learning. On that slide you had up that shows our, our, our vision, our, our achievement uh, you know, potential, that has nothing, there's, you see nothing about testing on there. <laughs> there's no, uh, you know, I don't care what your Pennsylvania PSSA scores are. Um, what I care about though is do you show empathy to others? Are you able to collaborate and work well with others? Can you take uh, two different articles about a topic and 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 break it apart and tell what's right, what's wrong, what's, what's good, what's bad, um, and make meaning of it? So in our sister school, Lionville, they've moved um, almost completely away from midterms and finals, and they're emphasizing and focusing on a capstone project, which is similar to a passion project that'll be worked on for the entire length of the year. In our building, um, we've had uh, departments uh, who have wanted to do away with midterms and finals, because as we know, the research shows you cram for those things, and two weeks later, uh, you probably couldn't pass the same test you took. And I'll use the seventh grade science as an example. Um, they spent about 10 total instructional days preparing and taking midterms and finals. They broke down the questions on those finals for me to show that the highest uh, depth of knowledge question on that final or midterm was a three. Most of them were level ones, which is just uh, information recall. In fact, over 60% of the tests were that, and no DOK4, you can't get to that level. We have now replaced them with curricular-based authentic learning projects, We're calling them celebrations of learning. Um, three different projects throughout the course of the marking periods to demonstrate a deeper learning depth over the breadth um, in topics such as ecology, um, uh, physics, uh, the life sciences, biology, whatnot. Over the course of these three projects, the third one will be the big one where they will then be demonstrating to an, an authentic audience that we're inviting from the outside. And it's gonna be a Rube Goldberg experiment in the area of physics. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna dovetail too far into that, but we just had our first ecology celebration of learning, which is the focusing on the National Park Authentic Learning Project. And the feedback that we've gotten from both the students and some of the parents who came in has been tremendous. Uh, one of the comments that struck me the most in the, the student feedback post project, one of the students said, it was very cool to have a choice in what I got to learn about. Hmm. And 
that, to, that, that was simple, right? But it says a lot. Student choice, agency, um, giving students the ability to uh, guide and direct their own learning. We're just taking a, a, a peek at some of the photos you sent about the National Parks project. Yeah, the cool part about this project was, so yeah, there's there's the content piece, right? So you had to learn about a particular uh, national park and the resources and why that park is, uh, you know, uh, valuable from an ecology standpoint, that learning. But the cool part was the persuasive piece they had to write as to why we should provide funding to support those parks. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into, you know, you're, you're tying into ELA, um, a lot of the debate work that takes place in history you're focusing on, there's a, a little bit of math in there when you look at the amount of money and resources that are spent. So it promotes critical thinking. Now, like any project, this is our first time through, right? We know we had student engagement. Rigor is always the area where sometimes you have to evaluate and find ways to beef it up. So we're looking for ways moving forward to increase the rigor even further um, for our students and things. Just, you know, <clears throat> right out of the gate, what was the sort of uh, what kind of feedback or what, more importantly, what sort of pushback did you, I'm sure you anticipated some, what what type of pushback against test prep, um, you know, because a lot of parents, I'm sure, or believe strongly that they, you know, that there's some sort of absence if we remove any of that, that their there, students are going to be at a disadvantage if we remove some of that test prep time. Um, how was that, did was the pushback you received louder or quieter than you had expected? A, a lot quieter. Now it's a it's a two it's a, a road that forks. Okay, the first fork on the road is the mandatory state testing. The parents have been rebelling against that for the past couple of years. That's been a uh, you know a Facebook trend. <laughs> yeah, we're going to opt out of the test. We're going to we're going to strike out against Common Core, um, even though it really has nothing to do with Common Core. So our message there um, was simple, you know, in that hey, you know, we're not going to put any time, we're not going to put time into uh, prepping for these standardized tests. We're going to focus on this authentic learning. Parents are all about that. The other end though is oh my God, if you take away a midterm and final, how will we know? what our kids grade is, how will we know what we learned? And more importantly for parents, as and we all know this as educators, they did it this way. Wait, this is how I showed my learning, okay? So when we started to show the parents, okay, well, we've taken away 10 days of testing and test prep and replaced it with this type of learning. It's hard to not get on board with that. You know, these projects, we have rubrics. We have, way, you know, the rubrics were based on the four C's actually, um, which was a, a, a pretty cool way to kind of do it for the, uh, you know, kudos, the teachers make all this work, obviously. But, um, you know, I haven't really had to expend a lot of the capital I talked about earlier. You know what I mean? I haven't had to cash in many debits yet um, to, to make this to make this happen. And in education, and this is an important point, we have to make decisions, hundreds of them every day as principals, as teachers, etc. One of the things I've learned over the past 18 years is there are very few hills worth dying on. And when you find a hill that's worth dying on, you really got to put a lot of focus and energy towards it. And this is one of those hills that we've decided is is really important and is worth dying on. Um, so that's where all the energy goes. A lot of the time and focus is spent. Um, and again, we've been building to this for years now. So it's not just this, this came out of nowhere. So there's so many questions and things I want to talk to you about. And I'm always so worried about coming up short when it comes to LEAP. Um, so I want to push forward a little bit, but one question we got from one of our, uh, we just talked a little bit about a parental pushback, but a question we got from uh, Ms. McKenna is, how do you convince teachers that these passion projects are as rigorous as general elections and exams? So, you know, how do you overcome that fear of the teacher, you know, a teacher be feeling that their general methodology is being replaced in some way? Um, well, it's it's scary, like we said, and yet we have to have a lot of time dedicated to the PD. You know, we don't just throw our teachers out to the wolves with this. What's helped us the most in the areas where we have been making this push is number one, we've taken the midterms and finals, and like I talked about, we broke down the level of rigor attached to it. Right, so we demonstrated that over sixty percent of the midterms and finals were DOK level one. Right, I can Google the answer to every one of those questions. Why do we have to spend time memorizing and prepping for that? Right, there, I'm not saying it's not valuable in some ways because yes, there is there is content that everyone should know, universal content. Right, but beyond that, then you start showing ways that you can access this information in a little bit of a different way, in a way that's more fun for the kids and for the teachers. Once we start engaging them at that level, 
um, I think it, it becomes easier. But again, you need the time. We need to provide the time. And one of the things we did to do that this year was we altered our master schedule because the master schedule drives everything. So you want to show that you support something, you show it in the master schedule. We made sure that all of our departments per grade level had common meeting and planning time this year. Maybe more than anything, that was the biggest thing for our teachers that showed them we were serious and that we were going to give them the time to really do this, to make these changes, to try new things. And it wasn't mandatory. Um, all of math is still giving the midterms and finals because, honestly, we haven't come up with a good way to more authentically assess that. So I'm not saying one is better, one is right or wrong, but I think it's really easy to justify going in this direction when 10 out of 180 school days were already dedicated to lower level test prep. So that leads me to the third point I wanted to bring up today. You know, anecdotally, in school, I was always an average student. Um, and I found that at the end of the year, we all had to gather for this for an award ceremony. Parents came, yep. students came. And generally, I sat there and watched my, my peers be rewarded for uh, achieving high academic um, uh, achieving high high academically, and I sort of was always left just as an observer. And I think you were able to, or you guys are starting a new initiative to sort of combat that feeling, and once again um, reward people based on these new criteria. And I, I think it's it's worth noting to close our interview here. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and this is actually where um, my deepest passion um, for the things we've talked about today lies, uh, to be completely honest. So for eight years, I got here to Downingtown Middle School, and the end of the year awards assembly featured uh, basically almost every student in the building getting recognized because we gave awards for honor roll and high honor roll and then distinguished honor roll. And then we gave giant plaques to kids who made distinguished honor roll for all three years in the middle school. And then we gave perfect attendance awards. And then we, uh, da, 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 on and on. None of which has anything to do with learning. It's, that's playing the game, the grades, the letter grades. There's so much subjectivity there. Now, I know there's going to be people who don't believe in this and who don't agree and don't feel strongly. And that's fine. Um, but this is where we want it to push. And so we started phasing out those big plaques, and we started phasing in new awards that we called Love of Learning Awards, where the departments would get together and pick one student, it doesn't matter what their grades were, that showed a passion for science or showed a high level of interest in mathematics. And we started awarding those things. And basically, we've increased that level and decreased the other level um, to the point where instead of having that one big ceremony per night, we turned it into a team-based thing where we had four different ceremonies for each team. And now we have finally, after eight years, phased those out entirely. What we have now are uh, four times a year. We call them celebrations of learning. And it's based around our uh, school-wide positive behavioral uh, intervention system. So the three R's are responsibility, resourcefulness, and respect. Each of the teams in each of the departments, one time per marking period, picks one student in each of those areas who they feel exemplify those characteristics. So yes, it's a love of learning, but it's also more about, is the student able to be resourceful and solve problems? Are they respectful to each other, to staff, to the entire community? You know, what are they putting out into the world? And are they responsible? Or do they take, do they accept, uh, uh, you know, do they own their actions, basically? So we have, it's a very small thing. We're only doing about 40 kids that are recognized per marking period. We invite their families. We have a nice big breakfast for them. We bring in a keynote speaker to talk about one of the three R's. And in the, uh, we actually have a, a posting of one of my, my speech from the very first one where, uh, you know, I talk about how I have failed our population uh, over the past eight years by not recognizing these things uh, more importantly than the traditional, you know, academics. Because, you know, we can engage kids at the level of, uh, you know, ritual compliance. Uh, you know, what do I have to do to get the A? What do I have to do to get the credits? I want to make sure my resume looks a certain way, right? But you can't, you can't replace the importance of uh, under, being in someone, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, being a good person and all those things. So the, um, the shift has started to occur. And uh, the most telling thing that happened was we videoed the ceremony. and. At the end of the, as all the parents and the kids are leaving, it just so happens interaction takes place between a mom and a dad and their kid. 
where they were like hugging their child for 30 seconds straight, just saying how proud they were of them because this is the stuff that really matters. I had a mom come up to me after the ceremony and said, man, I just thought this was a, you know, hey, we got A's this marking period. My husband didn't even come. If he had known this is what it was about, he would have been here. Um, the com our community wants to accept these things. This, this, this is um, what everything we're talking about, everything we believe in. Um, and we have to put our money where our mouth is. Not only do we have to talk the talk, we have to demonstrate that this is where we're headed and this is what we're doing. Now, I've had a tremendous amount of pushback over the past eight years on getting rid of the plaques. Um, you know, the plaques that are now sitting in someone's attic, you know, before you're, I don't care that you got, I don't care that you got straight A's, you know, across uh, three years. Uh, that's, if that was a goal you set for yourself and you achieved it, that's great. But that's a goal for what reason? What learning went along with that? What was the real purpose behind that? And I'm not, I'm not discrediting the need for discipline and, and that there are, there is importance to that. However, there's a lot more of value for our kids in the real world moving forward with the four C's, you know, which is kind of where we're headed and what we're talking about now. And the same thing goes with perfect attendance awards. You know, we've gotten rid of those as well. If you're sick, if you have bronchitis or pneumonia or strep throat, I don't want you in school. Get healthy, take care of yourself. For kids in high school, there's value to uh, mental health days occasionally, you know, and, I, and hey, maybe I'm the rebel or whatever, but you know, I appreciate the discipline. I appreciate parents who push their kids, but um, you know those perfect attendance awards are also a slap in the face of kids who do get sick, of kids who maybe have bigger issues going on, who can't be in school every day. And when we're looking at the different ways of uh, creating school with cyber and blended options now as well, attendance looks different than it did. Slight, slight, uh, slight uh, uh, soapbox. I apologize. Oh, not a problem. It's uh, it's it's the passion is really what I hear, and I think that that's. That's really important to, to communicate. So we've got about 10 or so minutes left, and I wanted to open the floor to our to anyone listening to really bounce any ideas or questions you have against Dr. Indeglio here. Um, he's really, I don't mean to speak for you, Nick, but he's really uh, really passionate about education, about the principalship, about educating our, our students. Um, you know, just while we're waiting for some questions maybe to roll in, anecdotally, I'll say, even working here at Schoology, you know, we're sort of a, a hybrid education slash tech company, depending depending on the day, which word comes first is something off debated um, be, be, between me and my colleagues. And even here, we're starting to see that 21st century work workplace developing, right? Like I had mentioned earlier, a, a huge portion of our team, our, our professional development team specifically, are remote employees. Um, so it's not just a matter of uh, working alongside them in the office you know it's it's about learning the, the best ways to communicate uh, about how to get things done and pass responsibilities um you know in a in a digital environment and that's something that's starting already so um you know just even here we can speak towards what we were, what you had opened the program with yeah happy happy to answer any questions i feel bad i, I keep looking at the attendee count and, I, and we've dropped a few since the beginning so uh, i don't know mm -hmm. if i've been as engaging as i as i aim to be from the beginning well, if that's your first mistake is looking at that. People, uh, we also package <laughs> these up and, and put them on the internet. So, um, you know, you can, you know, the people are working and, and are very busy. So we'll make sure that the, all the content is <laughs> available to them. Um, Sara, you've been so patiently and thankfully answering some questions. Would you like to chime in at all? Do you have anything to, to ask or to say? I think it's such an interesting conversation. Um, we were talking a little bit about this uh, on the phone and about how you might start seeing um, results over the next couple of years and the difference that students come away with and I think especially when you consider what they take away from sitting in a couple of hours of testing or we were talking about the amount of days that we're spending in testing and it's just so much educational time that could be used in a different way and um, but giving students the authentic option for actually choosing their own projects and I guess moving towards some of the concepts around project-based learning and even inquiry-based learning, it's a lot of the conversations I've been having recently have sort of circled back to that idea. Um, in terms of, of the teacher response, I would love to know what sort of questions first came up. It's a totally different way of planning when you consider creating a, a more of a project-based learning approach like you guys are with these four Cs. So what sort of a process or what sort of um, formatting or templates did you give teachers to support them through that process? Yeah, the, the biggest, um, not so much a question, but comment that arose from uh, 
my really, really good teachers. You know, if, if you're a Todd Whitaker uh, uh, advocate, if you believe in uh, his, his work, uh, he talks about uh, asking what your best people think. And my best people were saying, um, it's scary. It's scary to let go of the control, you know, to really go from being the sage on the sage stage to the guide on the side. Um, and the only way to get over that feeling is to to dive into the waters a little bit, you know, to try stuff. And the, the, I think what's important to also emphasize is that this isn't every moment of every day. This is targeted spots to pick, you know, you got to pick your battles, you got to pick your shots. Um, where does this work? Where can you try to, you know, put in some more student choice activities, some more authentic learning opportunities? When they realized that this wasn't some, uh, you know, canned thing, where this was actually meant to be truly authentic, um, they started buying in and they really, they really took advantage of the time we gave them with the, uh, the common planning times to the point where, you know, like our seventh grade history department, um, across classes, we're doing debates based on uh, the American Revolution and the reasonings for and against. And um, some of our teachers who are a little more reticent to try different things like this were pulled along by the teachers who were really gung ho. Um, so again, I think really, I keep saying time, time, time over and over again, time and resources, it's the most important thing we can give our staff. So, you know, when this goes up on the internet, Nick, and maybe there's an, somebody listening who who says, you know, this sounds great. Um, this zoom out, this this big initiative sounds wonderful, but I'm in a district who doesn't have this sort of uh, view, who are, I'm still stuck in a district who's spending a lot of time with test prep and very focused on scoring and is, let's just say, old school. Um, but they they feel a little bit on an island in the classroom and, and, and they're, what are, what are some things from the singular teacher perspective in their own classroom um, without a lot of buy-in from the stakeholders above them, um, mm -hmm. that they can start pushing the pushing the pendulum ped, pendulum a bit themselves. That's a tough question because it's hard to uh, thwart a mindset, if that makes sense. However, um, I'm a believer that good teaching, great teaching, uh, higher level uh, opportunities for students are ultimately going to at least lead to the same types of test scores that you've been getting. Now, I like to think that I'm an active principal, um, but to be honest, I don't I don't see every teacher every day in the classroom. So I can't control what's happening in that classroom every day. So I would say um, sometimes you gotta be a little bit of a rebel. Um, take a stand, you know, figure out where your most bang for your buck is with the test prep stuff. Do all of that. But then start making those changes, start trying the new things, implement some authentic learning. And once you've seen something that's worked really well and has been successful, find a way to tell your story, whether that's through social media, whether that's finding one advocate at central office or one advocate in your administrative team um, and, and get them on board. It's a snowball effect. You know, you start small and you start, you know, working it up and digging, dig, digging a little deeper. And you're going to notice eventually um, you're going to be able to make an impact, but if we just keep going along with our heads down and and uh, you know marching around with the the notion that this is education, why did we get into teaching in the first place? You know, how long can you go with your uh, with what you know is right being stifled? And I'm one I'm one of the people who stifled <laughs> teachers with the test prep and the the God. Let's look at the the growth data and let's look at the standards and item analysis to death. Um, and I'm, I've realized the error of my ways and I'm trying to change. So we just all have to be willing to fight a little bit harder. So um, uh, there's a couple other questions Sarah's trying to point my eyes to and I can't read them very well. So I'm gonna <laughs> let her ask. And then I, I have a final thought I wanted to, before we go, but uh, here's, another, here's the last question. Yeah, a couple of really good thoughts coming in. I think one that we both jumped to is first, how does the grading actually look for these student choice project-based authentic assessments? And um, John was asking. When okay. Thinking about you know that grading and Schoology, we often think about rubrics. So did you guys use some modifiable rubrics and share those through the platform, or what did that grading look like? Yeah, um, the rubrics that these teachers use for the celebration of learning projects were based off of the four C's directly. Again, it's a, a was it Chad? Was that the the, um, the questioner's no. name? 
John, I'm sorry. Um, John, send me an email directly and I'll get you a copy of those rubrics. I'm happy to share those rubrics with you. Um, and and b grades are basically decided off of that. We still have to use letter grades in the end, um, but we try to make sure the kids understand the learnings coming from the rubrics. Um, I can tell you also, John, that it's working because at our sister school, we actually have an eighth grade math teacher, okay? Eighth grade math teacher who is not giving letter grades. He's using the system that's called not yet grading. Just Google that, uh, you'll get a ton of search results that pop up. And the idea is that you either have, you understand the concept or you don't have it yet, not yet, you don't have it yet. And you're gonna work until you do get it and that's how they work the grading system out. Um, it's fascinating and my thing is this, if you can do that in math, <laughs> you can do it in any area. So I want to just give you a quick second to pitch how people can connect with you um, and what sort of work you're doing online? Yeah, um, I, the, our sister middle school, <clears throat> uh, John Ross, who's the principal there, he and I in 2013 started a uh, podcast uh, called the Rockstar Principals Podcast. So the idea was to talk about educational leadership and basically we're friends, we live in the same neighborhood, we would drive to school a lot together, we'd have these great conversations and finally said, we should be recording this. So uh, actually you, Mike, turned us on to podcasting and that's how we got started. So we've tried to build a social media presence and uh, it's expanded to really be the profession of, of education, K-12. Um, so really, we really want people to connect with us that way. Our website is uh, rockstarprinciples.net. Our Twitter handle is uh, rockstarprincipal, which you see on the, you've seen on the slides here. Um, and you can email us at rockstarprinciples at gmail.com. Um, we have a lot of content, um, but the idea really, we try to engage our listeners and talk about the topics they want to hear about. Um, and uh, we'd really like to connect uh, further, you know, we're, we're very heavily connected with the national organizations. Um, you know, we have a ton of listeners, which is great, but um, we, the more feedback, the better. It's all about engagement. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us for LEAP. We're looking forward to a great 2018 with all of you. It has nothing to do with grades. It has nothing to do with a test score. It has nothing to do with a rank or the fact that maybe you turned in all your homework, even though that is responsible. Which is why the message I want to leave with you is that for the past 20 years, I've been proud of being an educator in the public education system. However, I have to admit, I have been a hypocrite. I have bowed at the altar of standardized testing. I have allowed PSSAs to become something that are an anxiety-inducing problem to the point where 30 or 40 families each year opt their kids out of PSSA testing. The truth of the matter is I don't care about that testing. All that is is one tiny snapshot, one tiny point in your career here at Downingtown Middle School. That's not something any of you are going to remember years from now. What you will remember are the important experiences that shape your character, that help you become someone even more special than you already are. Your parents already know how special you are. They're already enjoying watching the people you are becoming. Our job as educators is to provide you with those experiences. Over the past 20 years, I'm happy, or I'm willing to admit, I failed to a large degree because I hadn't practiced what I preached. Today is our way as a school of saying no more. We are going to be recognizing, we are going to be rewarding the things that matter moving forward. We want you to leave here, not with a resume, not with having classes under your belt. We want you to leave with the skills to be critical thinkers, to be communicators, to be able to collaborate with one another, and in turn to be able to create. We want you to go on to your high school careers and post high school, being able to have empathy for others and being always willing to own your actions and have taking personal responsibility for what you do and who you are. We are so proud of all of you today, which is why we are celebrating for those reasons, why we have your families here for those reasons.